Thank you. It's great to be back. As I mentioned yesterday, I did teach here for a dozen years. Um, I spend all my spare time uh, on the Longhorn Network. So, uh, and spent uh, a couple days ago in a sports bar watching uh, the Longhorns go to the College World Series. May mean nothing to any of you, but to me, it's like, it's like Mecca, you know? So, in any event, it's great to be back. Um, what I'd like to do first is to talk a bit about uh, the, the urban-rural split in America um, that really begins after World War I. And uh, Steve Mintz talked about it a bit. Uh, so I'm, what I'm gonna do is just sort of some fill in some gaps. Uh, and let's start talking about immigration. Um, as you know, there was a, a really a growing belief uh, that really starts around 1900, that the immigrants who are coming to America cannot be assimilated. They cannot be Americanized. And these are immigrants, as Dr. Mintz mentioned, <clears throat> who come largely from Southern and Eastern Europe. Greeks, Italians, Jews, Polish people, uh, Poles and the like. Um, and they came for a number of reasons. One was that their labor was desperately needed. And the factories and the Carnegies just couldn't get enough of these people to work in the steel mills, the various factories and the like. You also had, in the case of Jews, generally turning, they had to turn their back on the countries that were now initiating pogroms against them. So they came for very, very different reasons. Um, but there was such an outcry in the country about the fact that um, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant beliefs were under assault by people who spoke different languages, had different religions, um, and very different cultures, simply were not going to fit in. And as Dr. Mintz mentioned, and I'll go into it in just a little bit more detail, in 1924, uh, the US Congress passed an immigration law that set up quotas for each immigrant group to come to the United States in the future. And what was extraordinary about these quotas was that they were based on the number or the percentage of various ethnic groups in the United States. But what made this uh, piece of legislation really devious was that it went back to the census of 1890. And that was really the last census that did not show the extraordinary numbers of people coming from Central and Southern Europe. So if you were going to look at the number of Italians and use the 1920 census and have a quota system, there'd be a lot of Italians who would be allowed in because they had come in the period from 1890 to 1920. If you look at 1890, it, there's, there are virtually none. So that is what really happens, that these quota systems shut off uh, the ability of people who have been pouring into the country from 1890 to 1920 to keep coming in. And what it does is to set a, a, basically a 2% limit on any group due to its population in the United States in 1890. So if you're from Great Britain, and you want to come to the United States, you have an enormous quota that is always unfilled. But if you want to come from Italy, they'll say, okay, we'll take care of you. Um, in 2346, we think we will have an opening. Um, and that really becomes the, the issue. And the number of unused quota system people from Great Britain does not go back into the larger pile. So in other words, if you're gonna have 200,000 people coming to the United States each year, and 100,000 of them come from England and Ireland, and they only use 30,000, that other 70,000 is done away with. It's not added to other particular groups. And that becomes a big issue, as, as you can see. <clears throat> and over time, it has a, a really insidious effect. For example, when the Holocaust occurs, uh, and it's, becoming clear in certainly in the 1930s that Hitler is singling out certain groups and that these groups may be exterminated. 
Many of them want to come to the United States, but because they come from countries like Czechoslovakia and Poland and Lithuania, they simply cannot get into the United States. The United States will take some. It will always take an Albert Einstein, and he does come. But for the other people, they basically remained and perished. So there, there really are consequences to this particular law. What I also want to do is to talk about a couple of misconceptions um, regarding immigration and these particular laws. The first misconception is that there's a Statue of Liberty, and as many of you know, a couple of hundred yards away from the Statue of Liberty is Ellis Island. And Ellis Island is where more immigrants came from in that era, legally, from various parts of Europe. The first misconception is that a lot of immigrants were turned away once they got to Ellis Island, once they came to America. And that is a myth. The overwhelming majority of immigrants who came here stayed basically and wanted to get in, got into the country. Now, when you're at Ellis Island, and I really encourage you all to go to the Ellis Island Museum and the old Ellis Island Hospital, which are open to the public, there would be doctors. And the doctors would look, they'd have a hook, and they'd pick up your eyelid and look for trachoma, which was a deadly infectious disease that caused blindness and worse. Um, they would do a, a sort of a rudimentary physical exam. They would put you through very narrow corridors where you walk up a long series of steps, and anyone who was wheezing at the end um, basically was cast aside, and an X was put on that person for further medical evaluation. Most of them <clears throat> who had medical issues wound up in the Ellis Island Hospital and then were fine and then were allowed to come into the United States. There's also a sense that lots of people who had radical views were sent back. Some very famous people like Emma Goldman you know, and others were sent back. They, they had been in the country for quite a while. They were not citizens and they were deported. But this happened very, very rarely at Ellis Island. So once you got to the island, your chances of getting in were extremely high. And one of the reasons this occurred is that an evaluation of each immigrant was done in Europe before that person got on a steamship. And if the steamship company allowed people on who were 80 years old and might become a public charge or someone with an obvious facial rash, they were then responsible for bringing that immigrant back to the country he or she came from. And it cost money, and they didn't want to do that. So in a sense, they really uh, they were the first line of defense. The second misconception is that almost everyone who came to America stayed. And this is important because it sort of mirrors and mimics, in a way, what is happening on our southern border today. Um, people who have studied steamship passenger lists have found the following. Um, Almost 50% of the people who came over as immigrants returned to their home countries within five years. The vast majority of them were male, married, and unskilled. And what was happening is that they would come for a few years, they try to make as much money as they could, and then they would return to the family in Italy or Greece or some other place. And in the case of the Italians, who were no, the men who were known as birds of passage, they would work for a few years and try to accumulate money to buy land back in Italy. If you came as a family, you almost always stayed. And the only real difference, I think, between what is going on on the southern border now is that the people who came through Ellis Island were documented, um, and they were considered to be, quote, unquote, legal immigrants. But in terms of the movement back and forth, it really is extraordinary how many of them did not stay in America, even though we opened up our golden door. And the final misconception is that all immigrants who left Europe came to the United States. And that's not the case. A very large portion of them, as historians in the room know, went to Latin America. 
They went to Brazil. They went to Argentina. They went to Uruguay, which gives you a sense of kind of the push-pull of immigration. Um, there's a push to get out of the, the place you're living, and that the pull is to go somewhere else. But the pull was not always the United States. And that is something, I think, to keep in mind. I think it's, it's, it's uh, uh, very, very important. Let me talk now about the top, and that's the Ku Klux Klan. Um, when we think of the Ku Klux Klan, we generally think of Reconstruction, and we think of the Civil Rights Movement of the 1950s. Those were the two clans that were violent, anti-African American, denial of rights, bombings, uh, violence, and the like. But in fact, the greatest Klan movement occurred in America in the 1920s. It was largely middle class. It was based largely outside the old Confederacy, the South, and it was directed less at African Americans than it was at Jews and Catholics and other immigrants coming in. Um, and they were the ones who really pushed very, very hard to the immigration law of, 18, of 1924. Um, they're amazing pictures. You can find a, a photograph and actually a movie reel of 50,000 hooded Klansmen and women walking down Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C. to great applause from crowds, all dressed in their Klan memorabilia. The governor of Indiana was a Klan member. Senators from Colorado and indeed Earl Mayfield from Texas were members of the Ku Klux Klan. If you have your students study the Democratic National Convention of 1924, you'll know that this took 103 ballots to get a compromise candidate. And the reason was that the Democratic Party was so dramatically split between kind of its urban immigrant wing and basically its rural and largely southern wing. And the two big issues in the 1924 National Convention were one, let's not nominate Al Smith, who was a Catholic. He had to wait another four years until the things had moved a bit, until the, and, until the Democratic Party also realized they were running against a candidate they couldn't beat. Um, but the second thing was that there was an anti-Klan movement inside the convention, and they wanted one of the planks to be anti-Klan. And it led to one of the most violent, and I mean violent confrontations ever at a political convention, and it was defeated. You know, the anti-Klan platform did not go into the 1924 Democratic Convention platform. And the Republicans did the same thing with a lot less violence. Uh, they just tabled it, and that was the end of it. Um, let me give you one example of what the Klan could do before I move on. Um, if, indeed, the Klan did take over a legislature, and it did take over the legislature in Oregon, it tried to pass the kinds of legislation that it thought America needed. And the legislation in Oregon, heavily backed by Klan legislators, was that no kid could go to a private school in Oregon. All kids had to get a public education. What did this mean? It meant that you couldn't go to a parochial school. That's what it was directed against, and it's called um, uh, you know, uh, Pierce versus Sisters, meaning it was, it was Sisters of an Order who ran a Catholic school. And the Supreme Court, to its credit, a very conservative court, ruled that this was a clear violation of both the 14th Amendment and the, and the First Amendment freedom of religion. But on the other hand, that is the kind of legislation that the Klan supported. Now, the Klan, for reasons I can't explain, falls apart very, very quickly in the later 1920s due to internal corruption, infighting, and then finally the Depression. Up there, I think you see uh, William Jennings Bryan and Clarence Darrow, and you know where I'm headed with this. Uh, this is the famous Scopes Monkey Trial. Um, 
in Dayton, Tennessee in 1925. And this was really um, an extraordinary battle. Uh, John Scopes was a substitute science teacher um, accused of violating a state law that made it unlawful, unlawful, I'm sorry, to teach human evolution in any public school in Tennessee. And the little town of Dayton wanted to get on the map. And they realized that basically having Scopes, he actually didn't do it, but, but, but having Scopes go in and teaching this in violation of the law would, would bring everybody down because Scopes would be arrested um, and what you would have would be liberal scientists and university professors from the North would come down to testify. You would have, the media would absolutely descend upon Dayton, Tennessee, which it did. Uh, everything that came out of the Scopes Monkey Trial came out on radio, H.L. Mencken, probably the foremost um, political columnist and critic came down to Dayton, Tennessee. And it was in many ways a circus. And you know that um, when you look at these two men, the verdict of the trial is that Darrow made a fool of Brian by bringing him to the stand and forcing him to defend the literal interpretation of the Bible. And if you know the play in the movie Inherit the Wind that came out in 1960, um, it's just a complete rout of what are considered the forces of ignorance and bigotry. Um, and it's helped along by the fact that William Jennings Bryan, uh, who was on the stand and was really badgered by Darrow, died uh, several days after the trial ended. So it's always been seen as this issue kind of ended and uh, science triumphed. But in fact, uh, a, William Jennings Bryan did a lot better on the stand than he has ever given credit for. I think he defended creationism as well as it could be defended, and I thought scored some very, very serious points, but that's not the way it was written up. And what really happens afterwards is that other states begin to pass anti-evolution laws like Tennessee. And I think I don't have to tell you in Texas that one of the biggest battles that goes on in the legislature and your Department of Education has to do with the teaching of evolution in science classes. Um, as of last year, there were all kinds of motions on the table uh, from one, from one uh, committee in the legislature that nothing must be taught that basically um, criticizes evolution, the, the, the notion of evolution. But there are other people who very, very strongly believe that uh, things like intelligence design are equally relevant and must be taught to the students. Now the question then becomes, are these taught to the students as religious theories or are they taught as scientifically grounded you know, notions that are as important as evolution. If you would talk to the average scientist here at the University of Texas or anywhere else, virtually every one of them would say, um, you don't teach intelligence design. If you want to teach it in a class on religion or, or a class on certain theories, but you don't teach it as a science. On the other hand, that issue has not been decided in Texas, all right? Let me tell you one other thing that, that, that I think is interesting about this. The Pew Foundation did a, a very large study about issues like this. And what they found was that the older the person is, the more likely that person is to want creationism and intelligence design taught in the schools. If you, talk, if you look just at the, the cohort of the youngest people, they're almost they're very heavily in favor of simply teaching evolution. That's it, nothing more. If you also look at the pew, the older you get, uh, and I, I won't use myself, I'm old, but I, I, won't, I won't. The older you get, the more, the less likely you are to believe in climate change. 
In other words, you have many more conservative views regarding science. But there is one distinction, and that one distinction to me is fascinating. The older you are, the more likely you are to support mandatory vaccination. Why? Because people my age have seen polio before the vaccine. We've seen measles outbreaks. We've seen people killed. Young people today say, why the hell should I get a shot? You know, where, where is this disease? Not realizing that if you go below herd immunity, that disease is coming back. So you better keep vaccinating. But th there's a, it's, it's, that divide to me is absolutely fascinating. And when you're talking about young and old, the one thing the, old, the older population, it, to my mind, gets right is that vaccination is important. And the reason is they saw it with their own eyes. And that, that, to, that to me is absolutely fascinating. But David, they've also already been vaccinated. Uh, yes, yes. But the point is that people in their 20s and their 30s are not vaccinating their children. They may have been vaccinated themselves, but you, you look at a state, I don't want, you know, I have a certain amount of time left, <laughs> uh, Jerry, but, but, it, but if you look at um, the state of Texas, more kids are opting out because their parents are getting philosophical exemptions, religious exemptions, and Texas is reaching re really sort of a critical mass now of whether there's enough herd immunity to prevent viruses from coming in and, and giving things like a measles uh, epidemic. As one of my friends once said, and this is the last word I'll say, he's a, an epidemiologist, he said, what America needs is a really good epidemic to raise vaccination rates. I'm not sure I want to go that far. Uh, but, um, you know, that, that's, in a sense, really, uh, really the point. Okay, what I want to do... Um, now is to, I'm, go, I'm going, Mike Gillette covered this so well last time, there's no reason for me to go further. Okay, this is, I think, really interesting. Um, <laughs> if you look at this, a little bit weird, a little bit weird. I'm so lonely and unhappy, nobody likes a skinny girl, all right? Um, and we talk about the great Gatsby and the like, you know, what was happening. And this obviously was being put out by, uh, by, by, by corporations um, that wanted, that, that believed that American women were uh, too thin, all right? So let me very, very briefly, and I will put all this on the cloud for all of you, uh, but let me, let me very briefly give you some of the stats. In 1920, in 1920, the average American man was about five foot seven inches tall and weighed 150 pounds. Five, seven, 150. The average woman was about five, two, 125. By 1960, the average American man had gained one inch in height, but he was now weighing, rather than 150, he was weighing 166. The average American woman was five foot three, she had gained an inch, but had gone up to 140 pounds, 15 pounds more. Today, today, the average American man is five foot nine and a half inches and weighs 195 pounds. The average American woman is five foot four and weighs 166 pounds, which means that the average American woman today weighs as much as the average American man weighed in 1960. It's quite remarkable, and that's one of the reasons I'm showing you this. I, you, I think you all know the reasons um, that, and, and, and the numbers have really spiked since the 1980s. Um, but I think it is, it's, it's interesting to, when you, almost to, when you think of these people, to think of the body types. What, what were they like? Um, the average American male in 1920 had a life expectancy of 54 years, and the average American woman had a life expectancy of 66 years. Um, that is interesting. Uh, one, one of the reasons being that women always outlive men. In every species, every race, every ethnicity, women live longer. What is most interesting, and we don't have a whole lot of statistics about other groups in the 1920s, 
where life expectancy was 54 years. But today, the average white man lives to 76. In the United States, the average female to 81. So women still outdistance men. And what is interesting, thank you, is that Hispanics live longer. The average Hispanic man lives over 80 years today. So Hispanics actually are living longer lives. And we can, uh, I will send you stuff on the cloud that will discuss that. And if you are Asian American, and particularly an Asian American woman, you never may die. <laughs> they are like 90. I'm not kidding you, it's unbelievable. Uh, and all of this, as you know, goes to nutrition, uh, family life, uh, you know, there are all, there are all kinds of, of variables about this. But the, if you talk about the average American male uh, in 1920 living to 54, uh, and the average woman living to 66, what were the leading causes of death? Well, of course, cancer and heart disease. But what is also important to look at in 1920 is that among the leading causes of death were tuberculosis, right? A disease that is easily taken care of today by antibiotics, um, premature birth, and childbearing. Those are things that are not issues today. Um, if you look at the leading causes of death today and you take out cancer and heart disease and the like, um, Alzheimer's, meaning that we're living longer, diabetes, meaning that we've had great changes in our diet since the 1920s. Accidents, as Mike mentioned, there are cars all over the roads now, among other things. We're a much more accident-prone society. And suicide. Suicide has become, in some areas and among certain age groups, and, and, and certainly among college students, has become in some areas almost epidemic. The good news is that we're living longer. The bad news, unless the human genome system really tells us something we don't know quickly, is that we have leveled off. We're not gaining in years. What about crime? What about crime in the 1920s and 30s? Um, let me see if I got the guy. Oh, oh, oh I'm going to come back to that one. Uh, crime, Al Capone. All right, you all know Al. He was on the cover, sweet looking man, uh, on the cover of Time Magazine, sort of like your friendly uncle. Um, and there's no doubt that crime went up dramatically in the 1920s. And the reason it went up dramatically is the, the law breaking surrounding prohibition um, and the influence of gangs like the Capone Gang, the Purple Gang, Marta Lansky in New York. Um, and the like. The question is, did it continue into the 1930s? And you know, we say, we tend to think that well, you know, prohibition ends. It's really it's, I guess, the first amendment that is repealed by another amendment, and the only one. And prohibition ends, but we're in bad economic times. You know, will that keep crime rates high? And the answer is no. That crime rates keep falling throughout the 1930s. We would expect property crimes to go up, but they do not. The reason I think we as teachers believe that crime rates did go up in the 1930s is A, we believe that there is a relationship between economics and crime, and B, the media of the time in, in movies and in uh, newspaper reports was about John Dillinger and Babyface Nelson and Machine Gun Kelly and Bonnie and Clyde and public enemy number one, and the Lindbergh kidnapping and the like. And many of these men, not the Lindbergh kidnapping, but many of these men and women in the case of uh, Bonnie Barrow were seen as heroes. They were robbing banks. It was, it was Robin Hood. And it got a lot of, it, unfortunately, they were taking your money and not giving it back to you, uh, <laughs> which is always a problem with the Robin Hood syndrome. Um, but but th there was sort of the notion that there was this massive crime wave going on when, in fact, there was not. Um, we really can find no evidence. Uh, we do believe that somehow um, the Depression may have brought families closer together. 
that there were New Deal programs like CCC camps that took groups that were most likely to commit crimes basically out of the environment for certain periods of time. But the answer is we really don't know. Um, what is clear is that crime rates continued to fall during the 1930s. Marriage rates go down. That's not surprising. And suicides go up. But divorces also go down, which is baffling. And what statisticians have found is that divorce rates tend to rise in times of prosperity. I don't have time to go into it, but we can discuss it uh, among the students later on. But that, that's sort of, it's counterintuitive in a way, but it is absolutely true. And on the, other, on the other hand, I should say that we do not have a good handle on desertion rates uh, during the 1930s. And that is in some ways very, very comparable to divorce. Um, did Americans eat less in the 1930s? The answer is no. Um, you look at caloric intake, the best studies we have is that it was basically the same as the 1920s. What does happen is that they eat differently. Um, and I'll give you just a couple of examples because I know I only have a few minutes left. You, we've all eaten spam, right? Spam is a factor of the Great Depression. That's when it begins. It's cheap, and you can open the can 19 years later, and you're fine. <laughs> Eight billion cans of Spam have been sold to this point. It's quite amazing. Um, you look at cooking books, cookbooks. Casseroles were big. Kraft invented mac and cheese in the 1930s as a kind of uh, high protein, high starch, and very filling cheap meal. You know, you look at chip beef on toast and things like that. On the other hand, the 1930s also gave us Krispy Kreme donuts. <laughs> and right here in Texas, it gave us Fritos. You don't know that. Well, the story is that some traveling salesman was going through San Antonio, and he stopped at a Mexican restaurant, and he ate this fried whole cornmeal. He said, this is amazing. How do I make this? And the restaurant owner was going back to Mexico, and he sold this guy, the traveling salesman, for $100, the recipe. And the traveling salesman went to a new potato chip company called Lay, and voila, the Frito-Lay. So in a sense, um, there was a lot of ingenuity in the 1930s. Um, Statistics show that one person out of 100,000 in the United States starved from lack of food or water. And that, that, that's a, an extremely low number, if true. And the other thing is that FDR did give it, you know, one of his programs was giving out food stamps. In typical FDR fashion, he didn't want them to be for free. So you bought $10 worth of food stamps, and you could buy $15 worth of food. OK. Um, this is, you know, most people show, and I know my time is getting uh, close, so I, I'll go over this as briefly as I can. Um, I want to do just, you know, one part on sort of not only popular culture, but it's, its clear relation to the New Deal. Most people show Joe Lewis and Max Schmeling. This is Joe Lewis and James J. Braddock, and, and they were fighting for the heavyweight championship of the time. The reason I bring this up, there are two reasons. They both have enormous impact on the way we view our, our depression, the Great Depression, not only economically, but the coming of World War II as well. James J. Braddock on the left was a man, if you've ever seen the movie Cinderella Man, he is Cinderella Man in the movie. Uh, it's a story about his life. He was down and out and unemployed in the Depression. He had virtually no money to feed his family. He was having trouble getting fights. He went on relief. He worked on various government building programs. And they basically kept him and his family going in the 1930s. And that he, he is sort of almost a representative of a down and out person who was saved 
by Franklin Roosevelt and the Depression, and because of this, could put enough food on the table to continue his other occupation, which was boxing. Joe Lewis, on the other hand, Joe Lewis does win. This is a title fight. Braddock is the champ. Lewis knocks him out in eight rounds. But what we know Joe Lewis, what we know about Joe Lewis is the fact that he kind of symbolized the quote-unquote Negro that Franklin Roosevelt thought was best for America and that Franklin Roosevelt could, could trot out as someone who um, was really part of the American system. What do I mean by this? You all know, or some of you may know, that Jack Johnson just gave, uh, was just pardoned, he's long dead, but he was just pardoned by Donald Trump. And Jack Johnson had been heavyweight champ of the world, and he had been white America's nightmare. He dated white women, he married a white woman, um, he flaunted uh, his sexuality, and eventually he was driven from the country and, um, and, and jailed for a, a short period of time. And that's why Trump pardoned him. Joe Lewis comes along in the 1930s, and he's the antithesis of Jack Johnson. He's mild-mannered, he's deferential, he makes no demands on the segregated system. And then, in the late 1930s, he puts his heavyweight title on the line against Max Schmeling from Germany. I just want to, I have a, cut just a couple of quotes here if I can find them, okay. Joe Lewis became the embodiment of America and Max Schmeling who came from Germany and who had fought Lewis once before and had knocked Lewis out, Max Schmeling became the embodiment of Nazi Germany. He became Hitler's Superman and he was going to come not only to defeat America, but to defeat the black man that America had put up against him. The sad part of the story is that Max Schmeling was not a Nazi. During Kristallnacht, Max Schmeling had saved two Jewish kids. Max Schmeling said, I am no Superman. He wanted nothing to do with Hitler. And when he came to fight in the United States, he was not allowed to bring his wife and his family for fear that he, in fact, would defect. Meanwhile, while he's training, Hitler has a number of propaganda men around him and is just spinning all the Nazi tales that Max Schmeling is the embodiment of the pure race. Joe Lewis goes to the White House where Franklin Roosevelt says, looks at Joe, Joe goes like that, and he said, Joe, we need your muscles to defeat Germany. Now, this is well before we get into the war, and it's almost like FDR is preparing us for what is coming. The fight takes place. Joe Lewis destroys Max Schmeling in one round. These are some of the comments, and I'll, I'll pretty much uh, uh, quit with them. The Washington Post described Lewis after the fight as, quote, the, the lethargic, chicken-eating chicken young colored boy who reverted to his dreaded role as brown bomber tonight. And the UPI called Joe Lewis, quote, a jungle man, completely primitive as any savage who went and destroyed his opponent. In other words, the racial stereotypes still held, but on the other hand, Joe Lewis could be trotted out as Jesse Owens was in the 1936 Olympics as a black figure that white America could accept. And Joe Lewis later said that he was sort of embarrassed by all the publicity that went on around this fight, and he and Max Schmeling actually became good friends later in life. So there is a nice ending to this. So let me just say, Finally, we know about the Great Depression politically. We know about it economically. I think we should also know about the daily lives of the citizens who lived it. Their hopes, their fears, their strengths. And basically, to remember 
that went, what went on in the 1930s in terms of everything I've talked about really resonates with Americans and with your students today. Thank you very much.